everyone. Welcome to First Christian Church Online. We're so glad that you're here today. My name is Jordan, and I'd love to connect with you. I um, want to encourage you today, as you're watching the service, to take a moment and reply to a chat. Say hey to somebody in there. Um, we'd love to connect with you. Um, also, you can always hop on over to scottsburg.church. That's our website. And on there, there's an online connect card. Uh, and I personally would love to connect with you this week if you fill that out and let us know how we can walk with you. Um, like I said, great things today. It's going to be a great service. Thanks for being back with us. We're glad that you're here. Let's take a few moments here and worship God.
was on this journey I get lost in my mistakes What looks to me like weakness Is a canvas for your strength My story isn't over My story's just begun Fail you won't define me Cause that's what my father does Fail you won't define me Cause that's what my father
Hey everybody, welcome to First Christian Church Online. I'm Lead Pastor Matthew Craig, and I am um, excited to bring you a message about um, peace. Um, today, May 8th, um, is a day that we celebrate um, mothers across the world, but um, for, for a lot of folks, um, today's not always the easiest day. Um, and, and so what I want to do is, first of all, say thank you to all of the ladies that are in my life, um, that have been a part of my life and are still part of my life. The, the mentors, um, the coworkers, um, all of you matter and all of you, um, are just, man, a special part of, of my journey and I would not be the person that I am today without all of you, aunts and uncles and friends, uh, co-workers, my wife, uh, my kids, uh, my daughters. And so uh, to all of you today, uh, all the ladies out there, um, I hope that you're encouraged today by this message that if you are going through a hard time, um, I, I hope that you can find some peace today, some some unthinkable peace that can only come from our Father. And so um, let us know today, um, there online, um, let us know what we can pray for you about. Uh, let us know how we can encourage you. And just say hi. Just just type in there. Talk to your host today, your online host. Uh, they, would be, they would love to interact with you and connect with you. Um, we hope that you um, come and visit us sometime. Uh, here at our main campus. And uh, if you're watching this for the very first time, welcome. Thank you for doing that. And you can find out more information about us at scottsburg.church. I'm going to pray and uh, we're going to get into the message today. Father, thanks um, for today. Thanks for your word. Thanks for this moment that I can encourage those uh, watching online today. And, and Father, I pray for those watching. I, I pray that they will be blessed and that they will be encouraged and that you will be a part of today. Um, for all the ladies out there, Father, who um, are special to so many people, uh, may they have a great day and, and may you heal our hearts if we're feeling sadness. May you strengthen us. Uh, may you watch over us. Um, Father, I just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you have your Bible with you there, open it up to Luke chapter 24. We're, we're in this section of Scripture talking about the walk to Emmaus to where two disciples of Jesus were, were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Jesus meets them on the road, and a couple of weeks ago we talked about that incident. We're going to pick this up here um, after the fact, after Jesus has... Um, talked to them, he, he ate with them, broke bread with them, and then he disappeared. He, he left them. And uh, we're going to pick this up today, Luke 24, um, verse 35. Then, to, then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how that he recognized him when they broke the bread. These two disciples um, are, are coming now back to the other disciples. They're, they're returning back to Jerusalem. And, and it says uh, in verse 36, let's look at verse 36 real quick. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself suddenly appeared standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said, but the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, Jesus asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me. Make sure that I am not a ghost, because ghosts don't have bodies, as you see that I do. And as he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. Uh, a couple of things to just point out here before we get in into this. Um, Jesus himself is all of a sudden with them. Now, just imagine that probably freak you out a little bit too. I know it would me if all of a sudden, oh, Jesus is in the room here with me and Eric. Um, and it's like, oh, oh, what's going on? You know, you definitely would be uh, a little bit taken back. But um, Jesus says this, he says, peace be with you. But the whole group was startled and frightened thinking they were seeing a ghost. 
the first thing that Jesus says to them is peace be with you. This idea of, of calming, settling, um, that you don't need to worry, you don't need to be frightened. Um, many times as you look through scripture, when an angelic being appears or when God shows up, the person on the other side is, is frightened, scared to death, scared of the moment. Um, Moses, Isaiah, uh, Mary, uh, Joseph, all, all throughout the Bible, when someone shows up um, from, from God, uh, the person is, is extremely frightened. And Jesus says, peace be with you. It's important that we, we, we understand what Jesus is telling them. Peace be with you. Calm yourself. Be there. I'm, I'm here. It says in verse 38, Jesus asked them, why are you frightened? Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands and look at my feet. He begins to show them his scars. He begins to show them um, the, the marks of, of the crucifixion. And I think it's interesting where it says in verse 41, still they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. I think we need to give ourselves just a little bit of grace here. Sometimes when God shows up in our life, it's unexpected. We don't know how to handle it. And doubt, um, doubt gets a bad rap. But it says here, even after they touched his hands, touched his feet, even, even after Jesus showed them and talked to them, they still stood there in disbelief, but they were filled with joy and wonder. Isn't that a, a marvelous picture of what it means to encounter God? I think it's interesting what he does next. He says, do you have anything to eat? For the ancients, ghosts didn't eat. Angelic beings didn't always eat. And so it's, Jesus is again, reconfirming, reaffirming here that he is flesh. He is the risen savior, that he is real. He's not just a ghost. He says, do you have anything to eat? He's, he's literally, do you have any leftovers? Hey, uh, I, I'm, I'm hungry. I would like to eat with you. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he ate it as they watched. Sometimes it's just the little things that, that make this big impression on me. They hand him this fish, and they stand there and watch him eat it. Have you ever been in a position where somebody's given you something to eat, and they stood there like the whole company, the whole party stood there and watched you eat it. I've never experienced that, but it would be awkward. And Jesus does it to prove a point. He just is amazes me how he wants them to know it's really him and that he would go through something like that. I, I know that sounds silly, but it just amazes me that, that he would do those little things to prove that he is really who he is. And that's what he does in our lives. The disciples weren't ready to see this risen Savior. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. They just weren't expecting it. They weren't expecting Jesus to be, be alive in three days. They were thinking resurrection later on, right? Even though he told them over and over and over, they weren't expecting it. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to handle it. And so they were filled with disbelief and doubt, hesitation, wonder, and fear. Um, if we look at John chapter 20, verse 19, we get a little bit more detail here. And it says, on that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. They're not only worried and and scared what to do next, they're frightened. They're, they're worried about what the, the Jewish leaders are going to do. What, what is Rome going to do? And it says, suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you. Being fearful, being afraid, not knowing what to do next, um, it's natural. And what I want to do today is help us get through this, 
this kind of um, cultural unacceptance of doubt. It's like you don't have enough faith. You can't doubt. You don't have enough faith. You, you, uh, you need to have more faith. You need to pray harder. You need to do this more. Well, you know what? Sometimes in life, bad things happen, hard things happen, and they come unexpected, and we just don't know how to handle it. We don't know what to do next, and we're, we're kind of paralyzed. God wants you to know that's that's okay. You don't have to freak out about it. You don't have to worry about that. God is there to, excuse me, God is there to help you walk through that. But it's in those moments, um, it's in those moments of being paralyzed that um, you and I do some really crazy things. You and I do some weird things. Um, fear does that. And maybe today you're you're fearful of something or something's happening and like you, you look around the world and and you're fearful of what's going on. I, I heard a funny story, and it reminded me of an incident that happened in my own life. I won't share that one with you, um, but, but I'll share this one with you. It, it's a police respond to a burglar call, and they find something interesting. Let me read this, this news article to you. It says, in the horror movies, the monster is the scariest before you actually see it. For one local woman, that principle extended into the interior of her home, the county sheriff's office reported that in April, they responded to a 911 call from a woman who had reported hearing a person locked in her bathroom. She thought it was a burglar. She thought it was somebody locked in her bathroom, so she called the police. She said, I see shadows shifting under the door. I hear something shuffling around, and they won't answer me. I don't know what it is. It's, it's, it, it, it's scaring me to death. After the officers appear on scene, they ordered police come out. And it says, the, the, the news article says, with guns drawn, county deputies open the, open the door to encounter the suspect. And as they opened the door, they saw the burglar. It was an automated robot vacuum. It was a Roomba. And the lady had left her automatic vacuum going and it got locked in the bathroom somehow and it kept bouncing around the bathroom, knocking on the door, knocking things over. And I love what, what the officer reported. It says, we entered the bathroom and saw a very thorough vacuuming, vacuuming job being done by the Roomba vacuum cleaner. County Sheriff Deputy Brian Rogers said, the suspect was not taken into custody. However, it's likely to be sentenced to several months of continuous domestic servitude. Fear makes us do some silly things. The moment in my life is Farrah and I were married early on and we had just moved into our new house and a closet shelf had fallen. And I'm, I'm yelling and holding the closet door shut. And long story short, Farrah says, Matt, it's the closet. Who do you think is in the closet? I said, I don't know, but somebody's in there. You know, in the midst of the moment, suddenly something happens. You're, you're awakened. This is what the disciples were going through. They're all in this room, locked behind doors. They're not expecting Jesus. And they're listening to these two disciples talk about how Jesus is alive. And there, all of a sudden, there he is. It's no wonder they were confused and filled with joy and wonder. Could it really be? Jesus in this moment realizes their panic. He realizes their anxiety. He realizes their fear. And what does he do? He tells them simply, peace be with you. John 6, 20, another time Jesus calls out to his disciples and he says, don't be afraid, I am here. Luke 7, verse 50, and Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Even Paul picks up on this peace language. In Acts chapter 10, verse 36, this is the message of the good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. 
God wants you and I to live in peace. He doesn't want us to be fearful all the time. Now, are we going to get scared? Yes. Are we going to get frightened? Yes. Are we going to worry? Yes. But to live in a constant state of angst and worry and frustration and fear and panic is not healthy. God wants us to live in peace. 1 John chapter 1. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us, And we have seen him, and now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. John, Paul, Peter, all throughout their ministry, they wanted us to know, they wanted the people to know that God was with them. Jesus wants us to know that he is with us. So that why? why? Why is this important? Well, if we continue on with 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 to 4, we proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. Listen to this. Here, you want to live in peace? You want to have peace in your life? Then you got to have some people around you that will keep you grounded that you can laugh with, that you can cry with, that you can do life with. It says, we have given you this, we tell you this, so that you can have fellowship with us, so that we can have fellowship with one another, and that our fellowship is not only with each other, but it's with God and his son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things, John says, so that you may fully share our joy. Peace leads to joy. You you can be happy and not be at peace. Um, You can be happy and not be joyful. Joy is a much deeper emotion. And really, in my life, maybe you know this to be true in yours, the only way to find true joy is to be at peace with what's going on around me. Even things, even when things are out of control, I can still find joy because I'm at peace. Even when I'm in complete chaos, I can still find peace. See, see, a lot of folks think that peace has to be that you're all perfect, that everything's going well, and 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 you're that's the only way to be peaceful. That's not it at all. That's not what God's peace is. God's peace is is understanding that even in the midst of chaos, I can find joy. I can relax. And even when everything's spinning out of control, I have fellowship with God. I have fellowship with other people. I'm not in this alone. And this is the tool that really our enemy wants to use against us. He wants to isolate us. He wants us to to stay alone. And if he can isolate us from our friends, from our family, from our church, from, from God, then he can begin to work on our emotions. And he can rob joy from us. And he can steal joy from us and peace. He can't do it when we're in fellowship. He can't do it when we're living in community. He can't do it when we understand our relationship with God. But he's going to try. He's going to try to isolate you. And maybe today on Mother's Day, you feel isolated. You feel alone. You feel hurt. You feel empty. Please understand, that's not what God wants for you today. Jesus asked him, why are you frightened? Why are your hearts filled with doubt? I want to give you peace that takes away this doubt. Not not doubt in the moment, but when Jesus uses this term in the Greek, it it is a literally um, ongoing, continual state of trouble, of doubt. What he says here, we miss it in the English, but, but what he says is, why are you continually doubting? Not, he didn't ask him, 
why don't you believe in me right now? But why are you in this continually, this continual state of doubt? Why is your, your, your mind, your state of mind, why is it always focused on doubt, the negative, the worry, the, the fear? You see, in the Greek, it's a, it's a perfect participle that, that just means this is an ongoing thing, this over and over and over. And, and that's where we get in trouble. And that's where our enemy, the devil, wants us to be. He wants to isolate us. And the other thing that he wants us to do, I think it's the biggest thing that robs our peace and joy, is he wants us to stay busy. The number one, um, I saw this the other day, it was a map of all 50 states, and it said the number one things moms want for Mother's Day. And it was Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, the kind of the Midwestern states, they all said moms just wanted a nap. Some of the other places had, um, I want to cook a dinner, or I want a dinner cooked for me without having to clean it up, uh, a nap, a spa day. Um, everything had to do with with pace of life and, and being overworked and, and busy. That is a weapon that is being used against us to rob our peace, to rob our joy. It's interesting, isn't it, that one of the things that Jesus does, uh, we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute, but, but he eats with them. We'll, we'll, we'll pick that back up here in just a minute. Well, let me say this. If, you, if you're taking notes or you're writing this down, there is a difference between rest and being replenished. There is a difference between rest and being replenished. You can replenish yourself by only getting away and and drawing close to God and finding that thing in life. Like, here's this. Here's this. Let me say it this way. Have you ever been on a vacation and maybe you go to the beach for a week? You take a book, you take a, you know, a a non-alcoholic drink maybe. I don't know. You know, maybe you take a big boy drink. Um, maybe you you go and you get away, and it's just you, and maybe no kids, uh, and you're on the beach, and you're reading a book, you're taking a nap, <clears throat> you're at the pool, eating some good food, and you come back, and you come back to work, and man, you jump right back in, and you feel just completely exhausted. What you did is you rested, but you did not replenish. There's a difference between rest and replenish. And and I'm going to tell you, it's taken me a long time to realize that. I don't necessarily have to rest to replenish. But replenish, replenishing yourself, uh, it takes work. It takes time, and it's finding that thing in your life that you love to do. Um, if I asked Eric, Eric is here in the room with me, and he's a pilot, and I, I would assume that when you go up in the air, you feel kind of rejuvenated. You feel like you got more energy, and you come back and you land, and and man, you're just ready to go. He didn't rest but he did something that filled his heart up, his soul up, something that he loved to do. That's just for free today. That really has nothing to do uh, with this, the message other than to say this. You need to find where you're replenished. It's good to rest, but it's so much better to replenish. Maybe you're an outdoors person. I love to drive. I love to just drive with the music on. And I can go and drive and put some good tunes on, roll the window down, and I can come back recharged, ready to go. Some people love to hunt and fish. Some people, you know, love to read a book on the, you know, wherever it may be, your favorite spot. But there is a difference between resting, which is good, and replenishing. They're not the same. Um, I'll, I'll go on. How do you today live with peace and joy? How do you live with peace? Number one, 
you've got to embrace your humanness. You've got to embrace your humanness. You are not superhuman. Say that right now. I am not superhuman. Um, in, in the days of superheroes and TV movies and Marvel movies and um, DC movies, Batman and Iron Man and all these superhuman people, we begin to think that we can be superhuman, that, that I can do anything. But let me read to you Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Don't let the excitement of your youth cause you to forget your creator. Honor him in your youth before you grow old and say, life is not pleasant anymore. And then it goes on to talk about all the different ailments of growing old. You lose your hearing, you lose your sight. I I love this one. Um, Remember him before your teeth, your few remaining servants stop grinding. Before your eyes, the women looking through the windows see dimly. The writer of Ecclesiastes begins to paint this picture of of how hard it is to grow old. And he starts this with, remember your creator. The more you can embrace your humanness, the more you can understand that you are the cre you're the creation. God is the creator. I think the more you'll be able to understand how to find peace. But the more you try to be superhuman, the more you live your life without margin, the more you live your life and and with this go get it attitude, the more you will be robbed of peace. Now I'm all for working hard. I'm all for putting in the work. Um, when I'm writing sermons, I'm all for doing what you got to do to get the job done. But what I've learned is I'm not superhuman. And I can't be all things to all people all the time. I've got to replenish. I've got to rest. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Who has set the race before us? God has. We do this, we we set our eyes upon God's race by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. You are not superhuman. And as soon as you can understand you are not superhuman, you can begin the journey to peace. But as long as you think you can do it all, be all things to all people, the more you try to do it yourself, the more you try to live your life without God at the center, the more you'll be robbed of peace, the more you'll be robbed of joy. And when Jesus shows up unexpectedly, it will be a frightful moment, not one of peace. You'll be frozen. So one, embrace your humanness. Embrace that you're not superhuman. First Corinthians chapter nine says, Paul tells us to run with purpose in every step. Don't just shadow box. Don't just keep running to be running. Run with a purpose. If you're burning the candle at both ends, and you're not getting anything accomplished. You're overwhelmed. You're exhausted. You may want to look at your priorities. You may want to take a look at what you're doing in your life. If you have no joy, no peace, uh, no rhythm, no margin, you may be trying to be superhuman. Embrace your humanness. I love what Sharon Miller says. She writes, for many of us, the only time we're silent is at night. That's why worry and fear mob us in the darkness. Those anxieties were with us all day, but we were too busy 
and distracted to search them in the company of Jesus. Listen to that. Our anxieties were with us all day, but we were too busy and too distracted to search them in the company of Jesus. We were so busy, so distracted, so go get it gung ho that we forgot to remember our Creator. We forgot to spend time and replenish ourselves with Jesus. Number two, if you want to live a life of peace and joy, embrace your humanness. You're not superhuman. And two, engage with the Father. You've got to create time in your life where you are just setting with Jesus. You're setting with your Father. That's why I said I'd come back to. When Jesus sets with these disciples in this room, they're scared, they're frightened. He tells them, peace be with you. And what's the very next thing that he does? He eats a meal with them. He asks, do you have any food? There's something about sharing a meal. There's something about just slowing down and being with people that's important. It helps you be grounded. It helps you unwind. It helps you. And if it's that way with you and I, how much more is it that way with you and your Father in heaven? Luke chapter 5. Despite Jesus' instructions, the report of his power spread even faster. Vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. But Jesus, listen to this, Luke 5, verse 16. But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Over and over and over, all throughout the New Testament, all throughout the Gospels, Jesus withdraws. The disciples wake up, where's Jesus? Always praying. Where's Jesus? Always out there praying. Oh, where's Jesus? He's praying. Where's Jesus? He's praying. Jesus understood that he had to engage the Father. And I want to tell you, if you're struggling today, one of the very first things that I would do is I would just make time today, you and God, and just begin to talk to him. Begin to pray with him. All the time, the disciples were looking for Jesus. Where was he? He was with his father. To embrace our humanness, to spend time with our father, to engage our father, helps us find joy. I wrote this down. To be a child of God, you must first understand that the Father has uniquely wired you for a unique purpose that only you can fulfill. You have a purpose. And once you embrace that you're not superhuman, once you understand I got to spend time with the Father, what do you do next? Well, you have to understand that God has given you a purpose. And when you understand what God wants you to do, you've got to begin to say no to all the other things. And you may have to say no to some really good things. But there are things in your life that only you can do. There is, an, there is only time in your day, it's the same amount of time for you that it is for me. And if I can't do everything and you can't do everything, then you have to do what you do and I have to do what I do. And when we bring those two together... People are blessed. The church is fulfilled. The church is successful. And that's why it takes all of us. It takes you caring for your neighbor. It takes you caring for your, 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 your co-workers. Um, it takes you for praying for people. It, it, it takes all of us doing those things that we all can do. But then there is something that God has created in you for only you to do. And he's gifted you. He's, he's brought you through some things, and he's put you in a position for you to be successful. 
You must understand that the Father has uniquely wired you for a unique purpose. You can't say yes to everything. You've got to say no to some good things at times. And then two, we need to understand that God wants to redeem all the hard things in our life. Um, man, Mother's Day's hard. Um, you know, um, it's, it's just hard. Mm, it's hard for me, but it's a lot easier now um, because I understand that God has redeemed the hard things in my life for me to use them for his glory. And I know that I have peace in him. I know who he is. I know I'm not superhuman. And I've learned that God has called me and given me some gifts to use. And, and I'm trying to use them the best of my ability. And, and all of that put together, I know that God is redeeming the really hard things in my life. And he's using them to bring him glory. So there's two more things. And I'll quickly go through them. Here they are. Once you understand and you can wrap your head around that you're not superhuman, say I'm not superhuman. Once you, once you understand that, once you begin to spend time with your father in prayer, once you understand that God has gifted you and he wants to use that and God has redeemed the hard things in your life and he wants to use that, then you and I need to expose the grind and expand our space. Here's what I mean by that. You need to expose the grind in your life. Where are the, what are the areas that is just grinding you down? Where are the areas that are just pushing you to the extreme? And, and you're just going, 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 going. And once you expose those areas, you need to expand space. You need to make time to slow down. You need to create margin. And when you can do that, when you, when you can just sit down with Jesus and understand that he wants to be with you, then you are going to find more joy and more peace. Expose the grind, expand the space. Jerry Bridges said this, your worst days are never so bad that you're beyond the reach of God's grace. And your best days are never so good that you are beyond the need of God's grace. Your worst days are never so bad that you're beyond the reach of God's grace. And your good days are never so good that you do not need God's grace. I want to leave you with just something that touched my heart. August 2018, um, you may not remember this, but wildfires broke out in the Western United States, one of the worst wildfire seasons on record. And matter of fact, it was so bad that the Forest Service ran out of fire teams from the, the continental, the, the 48 states. They, they ran out of fire teams. They didn't have any more fire teams to send. And so they began recruiting um, these hotshot teams from different places. One of those teams in 2018 was 17 guys from American Samoa. And they are a Samoan hotshot crew. And every day after fighting forest fires, being in the midst of the fire, they came out of the fire, out of the woods, singing and I just want to leave you with this picture in the midst of the fire in the midst of what's going on in your life what a friend you have in Jesus you don't have to do this alone you do not have to be superhuman you're not spend time with the father know that he's given you gifts know that he's redeeming you Expand the space, expose the grind, and live with peace. What a friend we have in Jesus. Take a look at this.